Hello and welcome to this tutorial. My name is Fernando Ramos. I am professor for media studies at the University of Leipzig in Germany. And I would like to talk to you about historical documentary film uh, before you start producing your own material. Um, I'm going to concentrate on the following aspects. Um, on types and nature of documentary film, on documentary techniques or the main documentary techniques, and in the third part of the presentation, I will focus on the images of documentary film. Documentary films is one of the four main types of filmmaking, uh, along with, uh, along with uh, fiction, animation, and experimental film. And they are assumed, as a film, uh, documentary films are assumed to portray actual events and show actual people uh, involved in those events. So in this regard, documentary films share some goals with history, uh, some general goals, I must say, uh, if we consider the common realistic uh, positive approach to the representation of facts. At the same time, <coughs> sorry, the very historical character of uh, puts into question some of these assumptions regarding the actual events and the actual people taking place, uh, taking a part on uh, uh, those events. The reason is, usually we don't have material that enables us to look directly in the facts we would like to portray as historical documentary filmmakers. I would like to use this tension regarding the representation of a fact as uh, a guiding thread uh, on the following remark, of the following remarks, and therewith try to offer some answers to the question uh, where do we get our images from if we want to document an event set in the past? Uh, so let's assume for the sake, of the sake of the argument that we as documentary filmmakers don't have access to the historical episodes, to the events we are trying to portray. So which are our possibilities, the possibilities in our hands? <coughs> Sorry. For too long, the rules of, documentary f uh, of the documentary were set in stone. Archival, archival footage, talking heads, I mean interviews, uh, and voice-over narration laid the foundations of documentaries. Very often, a documentary film pursued uh, several of these options at the same time. Uh, filmmakers started to question those rules already in the 1960s, 1970s with the rise of cinema verite and direct cinema, which advocated for a more straight approach to the events portrayed on the screen. And nowadays we have of course more possibilities that combine these techniques and experiment with new ones, uh, <coughs> sometimes even questioning the very nature of documentary film. Um, but going back to the three foundation of um, documentary film, let me first shortly comment interviews and voiceover before we focus on stock footage and its alternatives. <coughs> uh, interviews, usually as talking heads, are, as you may see in all the tutorials, is still very important tools used by filmmakers in order to deliver information, in order to, in order to structure also the arguments, uh, in order to give the narration a certain mood, or uh, in order to build a relation to the historical episodes we are willing to portray. The two main types of uh, interviews are interviews with witnesses, which represent sometimes the only link we can we can build to to the historical facts, and the interviews with experts uh, with experts, sorry, uh, who deliver information and with the interpretation also a sanction an official um, view on on the historical episodes. Um, interviews even help build build a bridge to the audience, like in the case of the and indirect interview technique, uh, where we see a subject talking to a camera directly, as, uh, like I do right now, uh, but we don't see or hear the interviewer asking questions in the same shot. So at, uh, in this case, the people is addressing directly the spectator, and by doing so, he's building a kind of relation to the spectator, which is much more direct, much more directly, uh, uh, structure as, as in all the cases or in other, uh, with all the devices. Uh, regarding the voiceover, uh, it typically functions as a voice of God uh, commentator 
whom we hear speak, but we do not see. Um, the tone can be more poetic, can be also sometimes a little bit more, more informational, but it usually corresponds with authority. The filmmaker can also take a stance as a character of the film as he speaks on or off camera, that means uh, if we see him or not. <coughs> But, at, uh, but as uh, film scholar Bill Nichols points out, speaking in the first person edges the documentary form towards the diary, or towards essay, or towards aspects of the avant-garde or, of, or experimental film and video uh, products. Uh, the emphasis may shift from uh, convince, convincing the audience of a particular point of view uh, or approach to a problem to the representation of a personal, of a clearly subjective view of things. So it, it changes from persuasion, or shifts from persuasion um, to expression. Uh, let's now focus on the use and function of stock footage and some of its alternatives. Um, stock footage represents the main feature of historical documentary films. Uh, for decades uh, it has been or quite rare and quite expensive also to, to use. Uh, it corresponds, in a way, to the primary sources employed by historians. Um, to make a historical documentary film, we usually draw on archive footage, uh, library pictures, some films and photographs, on documentaries, but also sometimes uh, on uh, fiction films. Uh, with the digitization, a wider range of historical images and archives are now available for us, for the filmmakers. Um, um, another point I would like to, to, to comment uh, is that uh, as one of the consequences of the medi mediatization of everyday life, I have already commented in another video, uh, the quantity, the quality and the accessibility of materials portraying different aspects uh, of our societies have seriously increased in the last decades. Uh, simultaneously, it has opened up um, new perspectives, new fields in our approach to the past. Today, more than ever, we can look at the private images of a recent past, even as it at its, its darkest moments, uh, darkest moments. Sorry, uh, like in the, for example, in the American film uh, *Capturing the Freedmen*, the Freedmen, which tells us a story of a case of child molestation, and is based mainly on footage uh, from home videos. Um, home videos made by the protagonists during the 1980s. <coughs> Usually historical materials um, or historical material is also accompanied by charts, by graphics, by maps or other visual aid like computer-based animations, websites and other possibilities uh, which helps express uh, complex ideas, figures, evolution or change, illustrate geographical location or insert some uh, of the formulas, concretizations, refinements uh, which are characteristic of the historical discourse and usually tend to be set aside by the audiovisual grammar. That's the reason why this, this kind of um, um, visual aid is, is so important to, to, to make uh, historical documentary films. <coughs> um, as already noted, all these different techniques, interviews, stock footage, graphics, are usually combined in one film, but sometimes we find films based exclusively on stock footage, which has been newly arranged and new cut for a new purpose. Uh, those are the so-called compilation documentary films. Uh, the interesting aspect of this kind of films is that they show us how meaning is not something intrinsically uh, linked to or inherent to certain pictures um, or to certain images or certain scenes, but an effect emerging from a certain, nar certain narrative based on montage, based on a voiceover, based, based on, a s on a perspective uh, we um, build our, our, document, uh, our documentary film uh, upon. Uh, classical examples of this technique uh, can be found already in the work of the pioneer Soviet filmmaker Esfir uh, Shop in the 1920s. Uh, she made the fall of the Romanov destiny, dynasty, sorry, um, in which uh, she used um, 
uh, old um, documentary material fr uh, from the period before the, the Russian Revolution uh, 1917 in order to tell how the, the, the dynasty, the monarchy, uh, f um, fell apart and, and uh, how the, the social and the historical circumstances led to, to, the, um, to the revolution. Uh, another example could be uh, an, uh, the Atomic Affair, which is a documentary film from 1982. It's quite a different example. Uh, it uses uh, archival uh, footage about nuclear warfare produced during the 1950s, uh, uh, 1940s and 1960s in order to, to, to tell a qu a quite ironic uh, uh, tale on this, on this, on this period, on, on this, um, on this um, years, sorry. Uh, but arguably, uh, the most famous example of this reutilization of audiovisual material are the images originally recorded by the Nazi filmmaker uh, Lenny Riefenstahl during the 1930s uh, as part of the propaganda film The Triumph of the Will, which was uh, released in 1935. Um, images which were in the next decades used in very different historical documentaries which, with very different purposes. Some of the images appear already in the World World, World II uh, propaganda series by Frank uh, Capra, uh, who, um, which were produced uh, for the US government, uh, Why We Fight, that's their name. Um, almost every documentary film of, on the Third Reich has since then r relied on this kind of material, of, on this material produced by, by Riefenstahl. Mein Kampf, for example, uh, by the Swedish uh, director Erwin Leister, uh, Leister from 1960, or The Triumph, Triumph Over Violence from uh, Soviet filmmaker Mikhail Rom from uh, 1965, are films produced using some of the same material recorded by Riefenstahl during the 30s, but um, uh, telling a very different uh, or offering a very different interpretation of this of these images, uh, so these images of propaganda are newly deco <coughs> newly decoded in this new context, producing new meanings. Uh, the most interesting uh, examples of this technique, reutilization of, of old material, can be observed as material originally produced for fiction films is recycled for documentary purposes. Especially interesting in, in the way this kind of material questions the <coughs> that's, sorry that's especially interesting in the way this kind of material questions the, the traditional uh, boundaries of the genre. Uh, for example, <coughs> Night and Fog, uh, which was a, a documentary film made by the French filmmaker Alain René in 1955, uh, relies on archive, archive material um, of both documentary and fictional origins. Uh, he uses uh, images from the last stage, which was a uh, Polish uh, film, uh, feature film uh, from 1948. And he uses, it uses this material to tell a story of, an, of Nazi concentration camps. Um, nevertheless, it's rightly, this, this, this documentary, uh, Night and Fog, is rightly considered as one of the best documentaries ever on this subject. So they these examples make us raise some question in this regard, as to which are the limits of documentary, how much fiction resists uh, reality. Uh, we should come back later to, to, this, to these questions. <coughs> but now I would like to, to go on uh, asking a new question, which is what happens if we don't have material, the material in order to tell the story? We create it, which may sound uh, quite paradoxical. I think it's worth pause, pausing on this point. Some viewers tend to suspect that a documentary is unreliable if it manipulates. And in fact, it is true that very often the documentary filmmaker records an event without scripting or staging it. But the filmmaker controls the final editing of the images. So sometimes that is not enough. So a new material is generated and which are the alternatives? We can, for example, rely on objects and locations related to the story we are, we are telling. These are usually, uh, this, kind of, this kind of material, this kind of, of, of images, are usually employed as uh, introductory shots for transitions in order to su suggest uh, some closeness, uh, some link to the story we are telling. Uh, they are, and they are especially useful if we are dealing with a distant historical period. 
Sometimes the core of a documentary is based on this technique, like uh, Shoha. Uh, Shoha, um, Shoha, sorry uh, for the pronunciation. Um, it's a documentary, f well, documentary film made by the French filmmaker Claude Lanzmann and tells uh, the story of the Holocaust without a single historical image from the 1930s or, or 1940s. Everything uh, we see in this film was shot in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, Lanzmann goes back to the places where the tragedy took place uh, he visits empty fields, uh, the forest, makes interviews with some of the, of the protagonists, of the surviving protagonists of this story, and builds through it a relation to the historical episode without historical images. At the same time, it makes its own contribution to one of the classic controversies regarding the legacy of the Holocaust, this idea of the adequacy, adequacy of the portrait of the unthinkable, of the crimes who are, or which are too horrendous to be portrayed. So, uh, and his answer would be in this regard, uh, we cannot show what really happened. It was too much to, to be shown in, 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 to be shown in, in um, historical uh, historical um, images, so we have to make a kind of an indirect uh, approach to it, to offer an indirect approach to it. Um, another relevant technique I'd like to comment are the so-called reenactments. Uh, I found this technique uh, in, well, with regard to documentary film uh, especially interesting and uh, reenactments uh, that means the use of fiction material in order to tell a uh, documentary truth. In the reenactment actors perform a new version of an event that had already happened. Uh, this puts into question some of the basic assumptions regarding the separation between documentary and fiction film. Uh, viewers um, Filmmakers regard as part of a kind of uh, genre contract between both groups some intervention, intervention some by, uh, for example in staging, uh, as legitimate uh, in documentary if it serves the, largest, uh, the larger purpose of presenting an information or giving some impression of realism. At the same time, the use of this kind of material also raises important, ethic, important ethical questions. Uh, so we should try to make clear that the uh, to the spectator that um, these images are not uh, these images we are, we are offering are not historical stock. That there is a process of reconstruction going on, which implies certain risks and certain uh, choices, which are being made by the filmmaker. Let me now present you two last examples in which reenactment is a central aspect of the film. The first of it. No, first of them is the Thin Blue Line, which is a documentary film made in the 1980s, 1988, by uh, American filmmaker Errol Morris, and tells the story of a uh, crime, um, at the same time raises questions about the official interpretation of the facts. Um, Morris uh, used extensive crime scenes reenactments to recreate the central murder, murder and to dramatize uh, discrepancies in the accounts of the witnesses, of the suspects, and the police. Um, in this case, uh, reenactments uh, became a storytelling tool uh, that not only fills gaps uh, but creates mood and tension. Uh, the thin blue line also shows how reenactments can serve to illustrate the inherent uh, unknowability of objective truth, uh, a very interesting approach considering the historical narration. The fil this film shows how audiovisual text also can uh, share some of the characteristics of good historical narration, reflecting on its own construction and opening up alternatives to, to the established, in this case to the official truth. Um, the case handled uh, by the documentary was reviewed and his protagonist uh, was released from prison a year after the film's release. So sometimes films do change uh, the course of events, the course of history. Um, occasionally, the very use of reenactments uh, and the process of generating them uh, can function also as the main plot line of a narration, as in the case of um, the act of killing. This is a uh, documentary f uh, film uh, which was made in 2011, <coughs> sorry, um, 
Uh, it's a film about the death squadrons which participated in the Indonesian killings in, of 1965-1966 uh, and it was directed by Joshua Oppenheimer. The director asked the protagonists, uh, so the people who, who were part of these death squadrons in the 1960s and never paid, and never, never paid for, for the crimes to play their mothers. Uh, in front of the camera and to stage them as if they were part of a, of a film genre. So to play once again what they have done or what they did 50 years ago and play it as if those were part of a gangster film or a, a western film or a musical. Um, the protagonist accepted and played along. And, and at the same time, this process forced them to face the reality of the crimes and accept the monstrosity. Um, this is also a film which made a big impact on society and raised a lot of controversy in Indonesia. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and I hope we'll see you soon. I'll see you soon. So goodbye. Have a nice day.